Welcome to Geology Talks, the Geological Society of the Oregon Country. We are the oldest collaboration of amateurs and professional geologists in the Pacific Northwest. This is our monthly Zoom meetup uh, where we talk about our field trips, our lectures, and then we have a presentation on the geology news from our graduate student, Andrew Dunning. Um, I don't think we have anyone here to talk about our upcoming uh, lectures, uh, unless Clark, you know what we have coming up, or Barb, to either of you. And Clark and Barb, if you could introduce yourselves and explain your role on our board. Go for it, Clark. All right. Hello, everyone. I'm the 2021 president of, of GSOC, and uh, um, I've, been, I've led this Mary's Peak Tour, if, if any of you were on there, I know Crystal was. So. And uh, I welcome everyone. And um, and if they twist my arm hard enough and no one wants to be the president next year, I may, may run another term. And Clark, we hope you do because you've done such a good job. So I think you're- Look, look forward to every, uh, keeping up this uh, this wonderful organization. I mean, it, uh, it really is impressive and, and uh, what we do and, trips, the quality of the trips. I can tell you I've worked for 40 years as a geologist. I've been on many different conference trips and we lead, uh, we are comparable in quality to a lot of the professional trips. So, so my hat's off to the, the leaders who do that for this organization. Thank you, Clark. And Barb, tell us a little bit about yourself. Sure, I'm not as geologically educated as most of the society is, but I do treasury and I do membership stuff for the board and for you. And I like to watch, I like to hear about all our members mostly. I like being able to look into the records and see that somebody was a high school geology teacher and uh, knowing that and maybe referring them to someone else who needs help in some way, shape or form. Anyway. That's sort of what I do. And then I go on field trips, which are really cool. <laughs> Wonderful. Wonderful. Barb creates, provides an immense service to our organization. I'm hearing audio. Someone's got an open mic. I'm going to just mute some people who might be suspects. Uh, and uh, we have Larry Purchase. His mic, his video isn't working, but Larry is a, a board member emeritus and has contributed a lot to the club over the years. Larry, can you give us a shout out and say hi? I really should have given him more of a heads up before I called on him when he's muted. Well, we're gonna talk first about our recent field trip and uh, Wes Mahan is one of the people who went on that trip. And I know some of you, some of others of you were on that trip and I would encourage you to just chime in and with any geological knowledge or any specific knowledge of what happened on that trip. Wes, you wanna share your screen with us? Now we rehearsed this, so uh, we should be seeing that shortly. And you're muted, Wes, so if you can unmute yourself, we'd love to hear your voice. Okay. Um, now, I know what that- we're looking at? Okay, so before I get that, there are several people here that were on the field trip. In fact, uh, um, Nancy, uh, my, now everybody's disappeared. Uh, Nancy was with, we stay, uh, actually stayed in the same house, the captain's house. And I see, is that, is that Wendy? Did you and your husband went on the field trip? And of course, Barb Stroud. So what I, I'm kind of like a, a excited little puppy about geology. I, I really, <laughs> I, I mean, I took the pictures, but I haven't absorbed all the geology that I heard. It just was, it, it filled my mind and then started overflowing and I started losing it already. So I want you three or four who are on the trip just to chime in anytime because I'm gonna show the pics. And if you know what we're looking at and um, have the right geology terms, uh, yeah, go ahead. This is not, all I'm basically doing is showing pictures. So, now, Wes, who is the captain of which you speak? 
Oh, the captain of, of the Fort Warden that we stayed on, it was a it was a military fort built in 1901, I believe. And the, it, it was it actually was functional through World War II, had battery emplacements on the bluffs. And um, there was quite a few men stationed there. I don't know, but it must have been in the hundreds, um, if not more. So it was all old. It was all old housing and and uh, very interesting place. So I, I got to meet some new friends from the, or members of GSOC that I'd never met before. Um, so let's go. I, Fort Warden has basically been turned over to the state of Washington for a cultural center. And during the spring and summers, there's writers, musicians, and all the things to come out there. It's, it's quite, a, quite a facility uh, with barracks and everything that's been taken over for arts. For, and they have um, performance arts there too. It's an amazing place. Yeah, yeah. Thanks. Thanks, Fred. Um, so I was driving up the east side, Highway 101, I believe it was, up the east side of the Olympic Peninsula, which I'd never been on before. Um, and right in the middle of the woods, along the road, right next to the ocean there, or right next to the strait, is um, I saw this seafood restaurant. Um, and there were millions of oyster shells with this, with this little little boat on top. And uh, I thought it was fascinating. It must have been millions. But then I found somebody told me that this seafood restaurant has an oyster farm right offshore. And they farm their own oysters, which is uh, probably explains why this huge mound was there. Okay, and these are in no, they're not in exact order of the field trip. Um, the house, the door you see on the left, the, the house on the right was the commander's house. It's been turned into a museum for the port. And the first morning we got up, there was these deer. I, I think you guys can see my cursor wandering around there. So the deer came and came quite close to the back door. And anyway, it was delightful. The first night we got there, the wind was blowing 70 miles an hour. And they'd shut all the ferries down on Puget Sound. And I thought it was going to be a horrible four days. <laughs> but it, but it, it was the... The next morning, the weather turned perfect. It was sunshine and warm and no wind. So we had a really good fortunate turn of weather. Now, this story, this trip is all about the glaciation that occurred in the Puget Sound area, the, the ice sheet that came down from Canada, and in particular, the, the British Columbia part. And so the bluffs that are exposed are a history, a story of the, of of the glacier that was covering this area. And around Port Townsend, it was nearly a mile deep. Uh, I don't know if you can just look up and imagine a mile up in the air, but that's about halfway up Mount Hood. Um, that's how deep that glacier was. And it, of course, it, it, uh, the land subsided. And I, I, feel, I feel funny talking with, with uh, people like Clark and uh, Andrew listening in because they're, they're probably just uh, chomping at the bit to, to fill in. So if you guys have any, any additional information here, um, these are you know deposits as a result of the glacier being there, uh, sometimes running water, sometimes still water, sometimes uh, outwashes from the uh, glacier advancing, sometimes outwashes from the the glacier retreating. And there were interglacial periods when there was no ice, as I understand it. So we move on. And this is this was one of the most fascinating um, bluff exposures. Is there anybody in the audience that was up there that, that would kind of like to explain what's going on here? Yeah, and you'll have to unmute yourself. No? OK, well. Um, yes. Wes, one point you mentioned that when the, there were no glaciers, that's when marine deposits were, uh, uh, were found on these uh, side cuts. So it wasn't like when the glaciers left, nothing happened. It was then you got ocean, yeah. you know, ocean shore deposits. Um, yeah. So. Exactly. I mean, we have, we have, we have, we have um, things here that are, 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 are deposits from still water, deposits from running water. There's clays where there are more, more fine sediments 
and clays where the water was still and more, more cobbly and rocky when the water was, was in motion. Um, and, and they got jumbled up here. Uh, I don't know if Andrew wants to, Andrew, do you have anything to say about this particular fascinating image? <laughs> it's kind of a mess. <laughs> <laughs> so you got you got old rocks down at the bottom there, uh, and then you can see where they're all jumbled on top before you get to the nicely bedded and laminated uh, sort of looser kind of conglomerate. Uh, you had the current from, I believe this is a glacial outwash. Uh, so as the glacier is melting and retreating, it was sending huge amounts of water uh, towards the ocean. And it was ripping chunks of this pre-existing yeah. marine interglacial rock and jumbling, of, jumbling and rotating them uh, progressively to the right of the image yeah. as new sand and gravel was getting laid down on top of all of that. Is, that's my understanding. Yeah. And of course, this is a north facing bluff. So the Pacific Ocean is to the right and the, the, the uh, Admiralty Bay and so forth are over to the left. Tacoma and Seattle are over to the left. And one thing that delighted me about this field trip was I, I've only been on one other extended day field trip with GSOC. And whenever you go on a field trip in Oregon, you're you're gonna see <laughs> you're gonna see basalt everywhere. And you know, 20 layers of you know, 20 different flows from the Columbia River basalts. This to me was so different um, and so interesting. Um, there's only so much you can say about basalt, I guess, unless you're a professional geologist, but, but this, the, the history and these bluffs were absolutely amazing. Wes, I was uh, distracted for a moment. In the previous photo, did you address the question of why the sediments are at an angle? Oh, I, I think, I think Andrew would be a good one to address that. I'm not quite sure, except that they are facing like the the the, the direction of the flow of water towards the, towards the ocean to the west. Um, is that is that what would cause this angling? Um, it, I don't need. I need to know where it is. Oh, it, th this is um, actually the port Port Townsend that stretch um, going along from Fort Warden there. Okay. Um, yeah, that could be laid down by water. Yeah. So essentially we're seeing a sort of cross bedding. It hasn't been uplifted yeah, yeah, and it hasn't been tilted. It's it's a cross bedding, uh, as, which tells us that the water is traveling from which direction? It would be left to right. Left to right, okay. Yeah. Um, it does look like it could be some of that older uh, Eocene sedimentary rock, but I don't believe any of that exists near Fort Warden. Yeah, and then we took another trip further up and squim too. Oh, there you go. So that could be, actually, like I said, these are not, I don't think in strict order. So that could be squim as well. Now, if I'm remembering correctly, there's someone in the room who's from squim. Okay. Barbara, uh, Barbara's got her hand up. So Wes, I was gonna say, I this is on the first day. So this is in Fort okay. Townsend. Um, area. The North Beach of Fort Warden is what this is called for anybody who wants to go to actually look at it. Um, one of the things I found very interesting on this trip is that Kitty Reed, our guide, um, who is from the Quimper Geological Society up there, um, it, it's really had a lot of questions about what this was. I mean, it wasn't ever, she did not come out and say definitively, oh, this is this is this, you know, that often. So one of the questions about this particular one is, could this have been the debris of an outburst flood? Possibly the uh, Admiralty in Inlet may have remained dammed for some period of time, and then suddenly, explosively, let go of all its water, which could have driven this sort of thing together in this she called it jumble one. I think you mentioned that too, Wes. Yeah, you're right. And she did also mention that there hasn't been a lot of, of intense research on this on these bluffs and the, and the glaciation and the deposits from the glaciation. So she she is uh, 
and 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 dating and so forth. So she there's a lot of work that could be done there should any money buddy want to fund this research. But anyway, so ready for the next one. This is the bay the next morning after the 70 mile an hour winds and it's all calm and peaceful now. But, um, I, you know, there's a, this is looking slightly southeast. Um, but I, I would like to say that two miles across the strait from the beach we were on was the island I was born on, which is Whidbey Island. My dad was in the Navy, so um, I was born up there on the Navy base. But I didn't get a chance to go visit my my place of birth. Um, we and then, the, like I said, the weather was great. And this is the evening where the sunset sun is, you know, reflecting off the clouds. So yes. and you guys in Portland were having two and a half inches of rain these two days, right? <laughs> you have a question, Wes? Wes, I have I'm a Nancy. comment. Um, yeah. I think we have to remind or tell people that all the bluff, um, the, the bluffs that we see are a result and the, the characteristics are a result of possibly very small events. It could be a river coming out of the, the yeah. mainland. It could be a spit that altered the ocean currents. So there's no grand story. Um, there's so much sort of variation and confusion, I guess, that, that the geology that we're looking at could be right there and totally different 10 feet down the, yeah. the shore. Is that Excellent. true of, of sedimentary geology in, in general, or is it particularly true of this location? Um, a little of I both. Am, a little of both. Yeah, this could be the end, the end range um, of confusion, whereas uh -huh. you know, on the, yeah, that's true. I am. Um, on, on one of those bluff walks, um, and the, there was incredible, all the erratics, this is all Canadian stuff. And there's very little of these types of rocks, you know, there's granite on the left, and uh, I, I call it greenstone because it was very green, but uh, that's probably not the right term. Hey, Andrew, do you know uh, that, that erratic on the right, is, is that greenstone or is that something else? I mean, it's green stone. <laughs> it's green, yeah. It's stone that's green, yeah. Looks, looks like serpentinite based on a low-res zoom picture. It wasn't very schisty or flaky, uh, but I, do, I did get some of that as well. And I embarrassed myself. Okay, I'm going to hold this up to my camera. Okay, can you guys see that? It's a, it's a spiral shell, you know. And when I saw that, it was so thick and heavy. I said to the Katie, the leader, I said, oh, this is a, this is a fossilized shell because it's been mineralized, you know? Look how small that opening is there. And so anyway, I, I brought several of these back, which I thought were fossilized <laughs> mollusk shells. And they turn out, they fizzed when I put vinegar on. So she's, they, she and Shelly told, said the, 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 uh, the shells tend to be really, really thick along these beaches because the a marine environment they lived in was very rough and they had to grow thick shells in order to not get cracked. And I'm only, I'm only used to looking at, you know, shells that I find on at Cannon Beach and those are a lot thinner than these. So that was an, a kind of an interesting biological side note there. Um, and I'm not sure what this is. It looks like uh, some gravel deposited by water currents, but it was all concreted into the uh, matrix there. It looks like sand. It looks like sandstone, but it's huh. probably not because this particular bluff, I don't think, had a lot of sandstone in it anyway. Yeah, talk about the concretions that you saw there, Wes. Well, the, I'm going to end this with some concretions that'll blow your mind. Um, I don't know much about this concretion, but I just I just found it visually very interesting, so that's why it's here. anybody anybody want to say anything about what this could be? Yes. Uh, are you gonna Wes, are you gonna talk about the what Kitty was calling rip ups? Um, could have yes. I got one picture of that. Okay. Um, 
Paul, this might be um, what Wes will, th this obviously is just a separated boulder, but when it's in situ, it might have another story that Wes just said he'll talk about, okay? Yeah. Wes, okay. Wes, could this be just a little rip up example that we've lost the bigger picture of it in a bed? Absolutely, I mean, I, I, I think <laughs> more than anybody else here, I think anybody, any possibilities <laughs> is uh, worth considering. Um, those with more geological knowledge will would be able to focus more on maybe the conditions that 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 caused this. Um, let's see if we got this. Uh, here's just a general oh. shot of the group. Uh, um, and again, you know, uh, GMDs, uh, uh, glacial marine deposits, and and alluvium, uh, all kind, you know, outburst floods and all kinds of things um, cause these different layers, but there doesn't seem to be a lot of turbulence. In other words, the layers are fairly horizontal here and and didn't seem to be disturbed too much. Wes, is that uh, still the North Beach? It's still the North Beach, yeah. Um, I mean, if, if I'm wrong, um, Nancy or Barb or Wendy can, or Andrew, I mean, Andrew created a video here a few weeks ago. Um, Hey, Andrew, what, what, where along that stretch did you create your video? That was mostly near the parking lot for the county park. I don't know where you guys started your little beach walk. The county park, park uh, where, at Fort Warden? No, it's uh, to the west of Fort Warden. Oh, okay. Campground? Oh, I know, the park where we ended our walk. It was quite a ways up the beach. Yeah, okay. Um, yeah, I think this is part of that stretch. Wes, can you get instruction from someone how to um, change your screen so we see more of your picture? Does anyone know how to tell them what to click? I think he can zoom in a little bit. That might help. Or well, can he, I, can, um, I can zoom in here like yeah. this. Oh, but can he hide? Um, is there a way that he can? Um, Let's not do that at the okay. moment. We, I, we, yeah, yeah, I, yeah, I'm just using Windows Photo Viewer. I didn't want to make a PowerPoint presentation. Okay, no problem. Um, so that's why you're seeing my controls. But if you want me to zoom in on anything. Please, this is gorgeous. Yeah. I, this is where I embarrassed myself a few years ago when visiting family in that neighborhood. And I saw that white streak, which if you could scroll up just, and I thought, oh, I know what that is. That's volcanic tough. Uh, <laughs> yeah, that's what I <laughs> that's, I've seen that everywhere. What yeah. is that actually? Oh, it's, fine, it's fine sediments. I mean, it's I fine thought, sediments. Okay. It, look, it, it's, you're right. It looks so much like volcanic tough. Is it calcareous? Is it? I mean, it's so light colored. But my first uh, guess would have been uh, limestone or something like that, because yeah. down in the south, that's that's the color of it. Uh, limestone settlement is. Um, everyone. OK, you can you can stop scrolling, Wes. Um, Thank you. These bluffs, you can scratch with your fingers and uh -huh. and and, you know, get cobbles and sand out of it and mud it, they're not it's not lithified you it's know it's not lithified okay Wes we've got about five minutes so okay. if you can hit the okay. concretions quickly up, up in the top right hand corner I think that's either possession drift or would be formation um, mm. I'm not sure it's in it's in the guidebook okay here's a nice picture of a heron that followed us along the beach yes, it did. and I, I snapped my camera shutter just at the right time and we didn't stand for a long time under this particular stretch of beach. <laughs> As you, you can see why, I think this winter, two or three of these trees will come crashing down on the beach. Um, like I said, these erratics were so different. They're granite, there's this green um, serpentinite maybe. There's this quartzy, this was extremely quartzy, this big boulder. And, Excuse, again, excuse my, my use of geology terms. Um, and this might be rip-up class. Um, mm. Anybody want to comment on those? Andrew's shaking his head, yes. Oh, I got something right? Yay! <laughs> um, yeah, just ripped up maybe clay sediments or something like that. Um, got tumbled along. You can tell that the, the water 
the water flow here was going to the right, which is towards the ocean. Okay, now here's something. This was the last day, and this will finish off. Oh. We went to a place called Port Nodule, which is a few miles south of Port Townsend, right on the bay. And there is no basalt on the Olympic Peninsula except for a, 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 thing, called, a thing called the um, Crescent Formation. And it threw up, it sent up a dike of basalt right here. Now, where these two guys are standing, there used to be a basalt dike. It's been eroded away because it was softer than the margins of the dike. The heat from the basalt baked the sandstone. Okay, where my cursor is, that's sandstone. Where my cursor is between these two guys, that's basalt. And over on this side, we have a thin layer about a foot thick of, of basalt, which hasn't eroded away. And the sandstone on the other side of the, that basalt dike for about five feet has not eroded away because it's been baked hard. And even, even ocean storms can't really wash it away very well. Um, I, I find this absolutely fascinating. And, and to finish off, along the... Along the sandstone sidewalls are these bowling ball concretions. And, and then above them, you see these little dark patches. Okay, well, apparently what happens here, and again, I, I, please correct me if I'm wrong, but in the, in the core, right at the core of these are something that has some carbon content. Uh, uh, maybe shale, maybe young shale or, or something, or it could even be, you know, low grade coal or something. I don't know. But if you look at these patches, these dark patches, you see where it's lighter around the edges. That's where the chemical hardening is starting to happen, except it didn't get as far along as with these boulders, with these bowling balls down here. These harden so much that they're not going to be eroded. They get, they get eroded out of the cliff, but they won't be broken up and eroded away by ocean, by, by waves hitting the beach or anything. Um, here's some more. Some of, some of, you know, these obviously down here in the sand have been eroded out of the sandstone wall here. And there's some still, looks like some iron oxidation going on over here around this one. And there's a group here. And keep in mind, right on the other side of this sandstone wall here is that this right here on the other side is where that basalt dike was and got eroded away. Eroded away by the, the, the ocean action. There. The ocean, I think. It was okay. Just, it, it kind of blows stopped. my mind that a, a, a basalt dike could erode away we're used yeah. to seeing them. We're used to seeing them being more prominent, for example, yeah. in Eastern yeah. Oregon than the surrounding country rock. But here, yeah. you've—it's yeah. only the margins that have survived. That's yeah, amazing. In, in our country, in our part of Oregon, in our in Oregon, you've only got rainfall kind of maybe eroding away, and maybe some ice getting in there. But here, you've got storms coming up all the time, and there, that's way more powerful, apparently than the kind of erosion that occurs on basalt in Oregon. And do we uh, have an idea of the age of this? How oh, long did it take to, for those concretions to form? I, you know, sorry, <laughs> I haven't memorized the guidebook yet. No one's, no one's going to wait on that. But, you know, it's got to be thousands and thousands of years. There, the interesting thing is that a lot of the original sandstone for building the downtown building Portland's uh, downtown Portland buildings in the 1800s, mm -hmm. it was quarried from um, some of the sandstone quarries up in Oregon around Puget Sound. There's the the the, the most famous, uh, you know, Paul Paul knows all about this, but the Tanino or Tanino, which yeah. one? Um, sandstones are really common. Um, hmm. There's a building a block away from me. Uh, entirely built of those sandstones. And the Tonino sandstones are, are more erodible. They're softer. Yeah. They went up and got chuckanut sandstones. And there's also a, a Scow Bay quarry here as well, where they got sandstone that was 
much harder than the Tonino sandstones. Well, Wes, thank you so much. Uh, yeah. And thanks for sort of jumping in at the last minute with this. And uh, I will, we'll have a, a, a recap, I think, in the uh, uh, an article on the website. And then at the end of the year, we do a recap of all of the field trips. But I uh, really appreciate those wonderful pictures. I'm going to hand it off to uh, uh, Steve Boyer real quick. Is going Steve, can you give me under five minutes about what you've uh, some exciting new geological outcrops on the uh, on on Mount Hood, which is the way I'm trying to frame the results of climate change up there, and yeah. then we're going to shift to Andrew, who is going to give us the geology news. Steve, if you want to okay. share your screen I'll, and take it away. This uh, talk uh, came up uh, spontaneously in a, a, a meeting of a committee I just joined for GSOC. But and thank you, Steve. Um, um, I have. Uh, at the turn of the millennium, about between 2001 and 2003, I uh, looked at the all of the glaciers on Mount Hood. There are 11 of them, plus uh, uh, the uh, the snowfield that's kept uh, on the on the south side, um, and have uh, shared those with Anders uh, Carlson uh, and his Glacial Institute, and then. Uh, Two decades later, uh, September 1st of this year, uh, I went up Mount Hood to, uh, climb, uh, to climb to the summit to uh, scatter a friend's uh, ashes. And I took a, a number of uh, photographs of what's happening to the glaciers up there. And I shared those with Anders and he was pretty excited about them. Um, let me I'll share my screen. And then uh, uh, now, is that is that visible, to everyone? Not seeing it yet. Hmm. Do I need to hit on the first photo and then? Um, After you hit the share screen button, then you'll have the choice of what window or what desktop to share. Okay. And I hit the share button and now I'm hitting this and it's not zooming. It's not. No. Once you choose which thing to share, you also have, there's a bu button down in the bottom right hand corner saying accept, um, accept this setting or whatever. So there's one more button you got to click as well. Share. There we go. Now we're seeing your desktop and then I think we'll see your, there we go. Back to photographs? Perfect. Okay. So oh. this is looking up the south side of Mount Hood from the top of uh, the Magic Mile. Silcox would be right off to the right and you can see the southern slope is is pretty barren, uh, entirely barren of ice, and this is the upper part of the White River Glacier. Uh, this is taken from Triangle Moraine, which is at about 9,500 feet, looking at an old paleosol here, and this is a zigzag glacier, what remains of it. It's no longer connected now to the uh, Coleman Glacier. It ends right here, and it no longer goes over and connects with the Reed Glacier, which is on the other side of Illumination Saddle. So this glacier has deflated from, from this used to be just barely visible. It's deflated all of this thickness and uh, no longer connects to two other glaciers. Um, I'll just, this is looking down at uh, Timberline Lodge and the ski area. And this is uh, what remains of the top part of the White River Glacier. It is no longer connected. Uh, so its accumulation area is no longer connected to the ablation area. The whole glacier is in the ablation area because of the, the heat. Um, this is looking down from the top of the, uh, the White River Glacier. And this ice here is what remains of the Coleman Glacier that used to connect down to the Zigzag Glacier. And it's about 35 degrees. There's no ice, there's no fern. Fern is 
is uh, ice uh, or snow that's uh, slowly turning into ice. That's all gone. We're down to a bare surface. It's 35 degrees. To go up here requires two ice tools and front point crampons. Thankfully, because I uh, was there was not a soul on the mountain above Silcox Hut, and I knew that. Uh, so when in this unstable uh, uh, old Mazama chute, uh, any rocks that felt loose, and I knew I couldn't uh, trust to stand on them, I could just roll down the mountain. Um, this is what the summit area looks like, and this depression here is where the uh, old uh, lookout tower uh, used to be. And uh, and this is the uh, actual summit. And this whole area, uh, you, I used to be able to, to, to ski even in September from the summit all the way down the much of the route that I was just showing you. And now it's all barren. And this is... Uh, uh, looking at the route I had just come up, um, and off uh, to the to the north, here's Mount Rainier, or uh, Mount uh, uh, Saint Helens. Um, now this is the uh, photo I think that most interested uh, Anders Carlson. This is the accumulation area of both the reed that goes off down here in the Coe Glacier. And uh, you can see that there's not only uh, snow is absent, fern is absent. It may be that it's uh, it's been melting down so much that this is accumulation of, of silt that ordinarily uh, is layered by year. There may be several layers there now. This is, is these glaciers are disappearing. And uh, this is a shot of the, the Coe Glacier. I've moved uh, to the northeast uh, a little bit. And this is the uh, Elliott Glacier. This is the largest glacier on uh, Mount Hood. And this moraine is dated to 1760 based on dendrochronology. And you can see that there's no fern or no snow anywhere on this. Uh, and it's, it's retreating and deflating rapidly. Can you outline where the moraine is? Uh, uh, this is the this is the moraine. That sort of gray shape is the moraine. That was the extent of the glacier. Yeah, in 1760. In 1760. And there's a nice trail from Cooper Spur if you want to go up to the Elliott Glacier, and it goes right along here. And there's a trail that goes all the way around the mountain that used to just cross the Elliott Outlet right here. Hey, Steve, while you're on there, that whole underneath the moraine, I mean, above the moraine in the in your photo, that looks like forest, a huge forest fire went through there. Is that correct? This? Oh, oh, no, this. further up in the in the wood in the forest, there's a big gray area that ends. Oh, yeah, that is all forest fire. Yeah, everything burned uh, down below uh, the lodge there. How that long all, that all burned? How long, ago, how long ago was that? Uh, about a decade ago, I think. That's, that's tragic. Yeah. Is that the dollar fire, Steve? I don't re recall okay. the name okay. of that fire. Andrew is saying in the chat that it's the Dollar Lake fire. Okay. Uh, we have a question too. Is it LA Glacier? Ask Kate Eli. Is that the correct name? And Mike Goodman is asking if that's Hood River in the distance. Uh, so you got two questions there. Sorry. We wouldn't be able to see Hood River. It's there's a big the Columbia River is between this spot and that spot. Okay. Um, now this is looking at the Elliott Glacier. Elliott Glacier. Okay. That's the Elliott Glacier, and then this is the Newton Clark Glacier, and uh, this would be the Newton, and then the Clark Valley off to the left. Is there any interaction? Uh, the moraine was. 1762 is, is dated by looking at the dendrochronology of the, the trees on the, um, is there any interaction between that and the eruption of about the same period? Um, no. 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 <laughs> um, and then this, this is coming back down again and looking at the fumarole uh, and this was in a, a spot where 
uh, we, I was on the Mazama Research Committee and we uh, joined a, a student uh, who had accepted a, a, a grant from us and uh, joined her in the field. In fact, her uh, work in the field would not have been possible. We, uh, you know, helped her arrange a, a cat that went halfway up the hill and, and helped them with this. And uh, even rented some uh, scuba gear with oxygen tanks and two people went down into the fumarole to collect uh, samples to grow out thermophiles. And this oh. is again, the top of the White River Glacier, which goes on down here. And it's uh, separated now from the Coleman Glacier that I'm standing on here. And it's separated from two, they used to be continuous by a, an old moraine and the devil's kitchen area, a thermophile. That, that's one of the thermophiles that we were studying with her. And this lake has gotten larger, uh, you know, every year. Uh, I think that's 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 it, and enough okay. to get on to Andrew. Well, thank you. That's uh, discouraging uh, on the one hand, uh, and not to detract from the moral urgency of addressing climate change. But it looks like we'll we'll be able to see more and more of the mountain as time goes on. Are we looking down into the last? Uh, we're looking down. Sorry, we're where are we looking down in this photo? Down here. Yeah. This is the White River uh, okay. Basin area, and the glacier is just out of sight. It would be uh, lower and, and to the right, but there's a big gap between this part of the glacier and uh -huh. the lower part of the glacier now, so it no longer has feed from an accumulation area. I see, I see. Well, thank you, Steve. Thanks for yeah. that report, and we, we hope to see others. Uh, uh, other other uh, other examples of your of your adventures okay thank you thank you all right andrew we'll hand it over to you i think we're still seeing your screen steve so uh, i have xed it out okay we're you're done Andrew, go ahead. Howdy, everybody. All right, so I've got a geology news for August and September for you. Where to go? It disappeared. We can see you. That's good. Here it is. There we go. All right, this is the geology news for uh, August and September of 2021. I should really start putting the date on these things. So as always, I like to start off with earthquakes around the globe. We've had sort of a busy couple of months for earthquakes around the world. Our biggest event was a magnitude 8.1 in the South Sandwich Islands, which is down here uh, in the Antarctic Sea. Uh, that's a big earthquake. It's the biggest one we've had since March, uh, which was an 8.0 uh, here north of New Zealand. Uh, this is a deep subduction zone earthquake, maybe even below the subduction zone in the subducting slab, where the South American plate is subducting beneath the Scotia plate, which is right here, which is a micro plate. Uh, but it was not likely felt by any humans. I mean, this is because this is such a remote area in the Southern Hemisphere. Uh, and simply nobody is there. Also interesting on a global scale was this magnitude 5.9 earthquake in Australia, which was widely felt all through uh, Southeast Australia and even on Tasmania and caused some minor damage to areas of Melbourne. And this was the first significant earthquake in Australia since 2012. Um, I did a, a brief research to find out sort of the earthquake history for more of Australia. And just about all of the ones I've found in the last 20 years have been about right here. Uh, and this is the largest one to occur in this region in the last 20 years. This was also sort of a destructive and disheartening time for earthquakes. We had a uh, very serious magnitude 7.2 earthquake in Haiti 
Uh, this is the largest earthquake to rock the Caribbean since 2010. About 650,000 people have been affected with 137,000 buildings destroyed. Uh, current totals uh, have at least 2,250 people dead. Uh, this is west of the area affected by the 2010 earthquake, which struck closer to the capital city of Port-au-Prince. Uh, and there's been absolutely devastating, horrible, widespread destruction throughout southern Haiti. Uh, this is actually on the same fault that ruptured in 2010, although it's about 100 kilometers to the west uh, of that earthquake. And this is uh, part of the plate boundary that separates a variety of the microplates and the complex tectonics going on in the Caribbean. This is very sad, and uh, recovery and rescue efforts are an undergoing even now, uh, several weeks after the earthquake. There was another damaging earthquake in Mexico, magnitude 7, near Acapulco, which uh, was actually located on the subduction zone interface. So the uh, Cocos plate here is subducting in this direction. Uh, and Mexico is sort of, relatively speaking, moving in uh, a southerly direction. And this uh, earthquake actually occurred between the subducting plate and the Mexican plate, uh, North American plate, excuse me. Uh, damage is mostly limited to landslides and unreinforced masonry like this dry stone wall that fell over. Uh, there's been at least one fatality from someone who ran out of a unreinforced masonry building uh, and a large brick fell on their head. That is the largest cause of deaths in earthquakes. Uh, so when you feel an earthquake and you've got bricks around, don't run outside, stay where you're put. Uh, large earthquakes are unfortunately relatively common in this area, uh, but fortunately damage is generally pretty limited because Mexico is used to these sorts of things. Moving on to United States earthquakes, the largest earthquakes in the United States, oh, there we go. This is an old slide I accidentally left in. The biggest event in the United States was a magnitude 6.1 out in the Aleutian Islands on August 31st. It occurred in the subducting Pacific plate. Very few people felt it, very minimal uh, impacts or damage from that earthquake. There was also an earthquake swarm from a magma intrusion at Kilauea, Hawaii. There's no eruption resulting from that. It's just magma is always moving around deep underneath these volcanoes. In the continental US, the largest earthquake was a magnitude 4.7 in Wells, Nevada, which is located right here. And it was the largest earthquake in the lower 48 over the last month. You can see other earthquakes occurring around the country. Most of these are quite small. There were a couple of magnitude fours in California, uh, one in the Bay Area and two in the Los Angeles area. Uh, this is all normal background activity for the uh, complex systems of faults we have in the American West. As for volcanoes, it's been an exciting time for volcanoes in that the Fagradalsfjall eruption has continued to, to grow and become quite impressive, if you've seen any updated pictures from that lately. Uh, but around the globe, there are 34 ongoing and new volcanic eruptions, including a brand new one at La Palma in the Canary Islands. La Palma is one of the islands of the Canary Islands, which are controlled by Spain. Uh, and these are all volcanic islands which are sourced by a hot spot deep underneath the African plate. This is a basaltic fissure eruption with some strombolian activity. That's these fire fountains and this little cinder cone. And it's also feeding a lava flow which is advancing through the residential areas of the Canary Islands and about 6,000 people have been evacuated so far. Uh, this lava flow is about three kilometers long and it's move it moves about two meters or a little over six feet per hour in most places. Uh, the airport actually closed this morning because the smoke and ash coming out of the volcano has hindered the airport's operations. So now people trying to leave the island have to get on a boat and go to uh, Tenerife, which is one of the other main islands in the Canaries. We'll move on to some new and exciting research that has been published in the last couple of months. Uh, I was very excited by Mars quakes. I'm not generally that excited about planetary geology, but I do like earthquakes and detecting earthquakes on another planet is something that I think is pretty neat. So NASA's InSight lander celebrated a thousand days on Mars on uh, Sunday. And right around that time, it detected two of the largest Mars quakes uh, yet recorded. These are magnitudes 4.2 and 4.1. One of them, the larger quake, shook the planet for nearly an hour and a half uh, because the planet is cold and dense. Uh, that allows the seismic waves to reverberate and sort of echo around a lot longer. Uh, but it was actually over a 
thousand miles away, nearly on the other side of the planet, uh, this magnitude 4.1 was uh, much closer and had a higher frequency shaking than the magnitude 4.2. I don't know what that means, but I think it's interesting. Also on Mars, the Perseverance rover has sampled its first rock for future return to Earth. Uh, this rock is named Rochette, and it was uh, sampled and placed in a vial for a future mission to pick up. Uh, this is one of those vials before it ended up on Mars, and uh, the rover has a drill which drills down into the rock and places it into this little vial. It's now left on behind on the surface as the rover continues its journey, and a future Mars probe will go up there and collect all of these and return them to Earth at some point in the future. Now, this was a piece of research that uh, I think was very interesting because it uh, sort of took a lot of things that I like and put them into uh, a very interesting story. Uh, so one of the most notable geologic features of the Grand Canyon is called the Great Unconformity. And this is a large gap of missing time in the Grand Canyon. Uh, in some places, there's an unconformity of over a billion years of missing time. Uh, but new thermochronology research uh, reveals the heating history of these older rocks down here, which is called the Vishnu Schist, and there's a number of other uh, rocks as well. Um, oh, I've got a low battery warning. Let me grab my power cord really quick. There we go. So thermochronology is the study of heating histories of rocks. And these basement rocks, uh, they found out, have been heated and uplifted very differently depending on what part of the Grand Canyon you're in. And the timing of this thermochronology, uh, which goes back to about 700 million years, uh, showed that tectonic activity, which lines up with the breakup of the supercontinent Rodinia, uh, may account for some of this differential and quite severe uplift. Um, which would have caused erosion and which led to over a billion years worth of rocks eroding away before uh, these mostly 500 million year old limestones and sedimentary rocks were laid down on top of it. So that's all very interesting new research going on in the Grand Canyon. And sticking in the Southwest, there's new research being published on ancient humans in North America. So uh, the timeline of the arrival of humans in the Americas is sort of hotly debated and has been contested for years. Uh, but now we have sort of unequivocal evidence of humans arriving far earlier than previous evidence has suggested. Most evidence suggested humans arriving in our region of North America, maybe in the teens of thousands. So maybe the maybe around 16 to 17,000, some people say 14,000. It's a very fuzzy boundary, but these footprints, which are preserved in a lake bed in White Sands uh, National Park, uh, have revealed that these are actually much, much older, back to 23,000 years. It's the oldest direct evidence of humans in North America, uh, and seeds, uh, ancient seeds, which are in the mud above and below the footprints stratigraphically, uh, are carbon dated, and these are bracketing the age uh, of these particular footprints in this picture to 23,000 years, which is very, <laughs> that's a long time ago. Uh, these are actually, they excavated a little trench to better view these footprints, and uh, which also gave stratigraphy and uh, mud both below the footprints and above the footprints, uh, which contained these seeds, which were then carbon dated to bracket this age. That's fascinating. Uh, they found a sequence of footprints uh, which occurred over the course of about 1200 years. So people were visiting this lake. It was a wet lake at the time for a very, very, very long time. And also there's skyscraper troubles. Now geologists are a part of every major building project in the world. Uh, it's very important to be a very good geotechnic <laughs> engineer uh, if you're designing a multi hundred million dollar skyscraper. However, the Millennium Tower is having some problems. It was built in 2006 in downtown San Francisco, 
uh, and they found that it's been sinking and tilting far faster uh, than they originally predicted. Uh, retrofit efforts, a $100 million program to stabilize the building to, uh, to stabilize the building have in fact sped up the sinking and tilting, which was not the desired outcome. Foundations of this building are not deep enough. They only reach to sand rather than reaching down to the bedrock below. And this project has been seeking to install 250 foot concrete pilings to tie the building to the bedrock below. However, this uh, project has indeed increased the rate of tilting and the building now slants 22 degrees off of vertical uh, and is rapidly changing. However, the building's not gonna collapse. This is not a danger, but it is a reminder that you need to take more care when you're designing your buildings in uh, muddy areas. And I just thought I'd throw in this shameless self plug at the end here on some Oregon fault research. Uh, we opened up a trench at Mount Hood in August and it made K2 news. Uh, we got Dr. Ashley Strig at Portland State University. We got Dr. Scott Bennett of the USGS, uh, their collaborator and my collaborator on my own research, Ian Maiden, uh, are all collaborating on this paleoseismic trench to understand the fault history of the Twin Lakes Fault, which runs near Mount Hood. Uh, in this trench, we had two earthquakes uh, in the recent past. One's probably around 3,500 years, and the other one is probably around 1,500 years. Uh, but we haven't gotten the ages of that. That's me speculating because we have no direct evidence of the ages yet. Uh, but that's what we've been up to this summer, and the findings for this will hopefully be presented uh, either at GSA or the Seismological Society of America meeting, uh, which is uh, early next year. So that's all I've got for the geology news for this month. Thank you all very much for watching and I'll take any questions you might have. That's wonderful, Andrew, thank you. And we are gonna have Charlie Carr, one of the undergraduates uh, on our way to her master's, uh, who's gonna be talking about that trenching effort. We're right at our hour. I'm gonna stop the recording and um,